Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome into Tom Curran's Patriots Talk podcast. Big one today. Let's take a look ahead at the Colts. We have Stephen Holder from The Athletic out in Indianapolis. He's covered the Colts for a while. And, of course, we'll have Kyle Van Noy on the back end of the pod to talk about his bye week and also the pivotal matchup against the Colts. Phil Perry, as always, will be alongside. So strap in. All right, what's up, everybody? Before I bring in Stephen and Phil, you know, I want to go into something here about the Patriots compared to the 2019 Patriots, because this year's edition, in some ways, is similar to that one. You can look at the litany of teams this team has beaten, the Patriots of 2021, and see, eh, you know, were the Browns without Baker, without Nick Chubb, a really daunting team? What about the 25 to nothing win over Atlanta? It's not really the same Falcons team, even though they're six and seven. And, you know, they beat Tennessee, but there was no Derrick Henry. There was no A.J. Brown. There was no Julio Jones. It's all these caveats. And that's really what happened in 2019, too. You remember the team went eight and O to start the year, but they didn't really feel eight and O and on a historic pace. Well, they kind of got exposed all those games against Jock Schrosen or Luke Falk, or Sam Darnold or Baker Mayfield. Those were performances built on sand. And as the season progressed, the Patriots went four and five in their final nine games capped by a game in which Derrick Henry ran through their face in the playoffs and Tom Brady's time here was over. Why is this team different from that team? I wrote about this over the weekend. And the reason This team's more balanced. That 2019 Patriots team was an offense that was solely reliant on Tom Brady, Julian Edelman, and James White. Those two players, James White and Julian Edelman, combined for about 170 receptions and 1,700 combined receiving yards. And as the season went along, Brady's effectiveness and completion percentage dipped and dipped and dipped. Patriots were easy to defend. They fell behind. And once their defense was on the field too long, they were sitting ducks. This year's edition, they might not have a Brady or an Edelman. They might not even have a James White in the passing game. But soup to nuts, running game, passing game, short passing game, special teams, defense, pass rush, coverage, they got all the bases covered. And that's why I don't think you're going to see a late season swoon. But there is a hell of a good matchup coming up over the next two weeks. It's the Colts first, Saturday night, and then it is the Bills the following week. So let's take aim at the matchup against Indy. And here's what Chris Ballard, Colts GM, had to say just a few years ago after Josh McDaniels left the Indianapolis Colts, left left him, well, they left him standing at the altar. The rivalry is back on. All right, there they are. It's Stephen Holder from The Athletic. It's, of course, Phil Perry. And the rivalry back on soundbite will never, ever, ever get old. But it seemed like just screaming into the wind before. Now, this year, with the Colts and the Patriots on a similar arc, it could be legit. Let me give the skinny before I let you guys take a shot at it. Colts have won four out of five, five out of seven. They've also beaten an array of shite teams to over Houston the Jets, the Jags, but their losses to the Bucs and Titans were narrow ones, kind of like the Patriots. So, Stephen, first question I'm going to pose to you, are these guys good or not? Because we keep wrestling with that with the Patriots a little bit, and we conclude that they, yes, indeed, they are good. Are the Colts good? Well, first, I I want to follow up on the rivalries back on comment because, listen, the most remarkable thing about that comment, and I was sitting there in the first row when he said it, And I was doubled over in laughter, I will admit. (laughs) But (laughs) the most remarkable thing is he said it coming off a 4-12 and season. And (laughs) I was like, do you know what kind of courage it takes to say that? Well, your team was 4-12 and last year. So I give Ballard this. I don't know if they're going to win a Super Bowl anytime soon. They may or may not. But, hey, listen, the guy's got courage and he's got guts. So I'll give him that. (laughs) So as to your question, I think the Colts are – 
good ish. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, they, they definitely are a, a team that look, no one wants to play them because you know what they're capable of. The, the question is, can they finish the job? Right. And they should have finished the game against Tampa. There's no question at the same time, the fact that they had a chance to win that game with five turnovers maybe tells me something about them. Right. But, but then again, they had five turnovers. Right. So it depends on your perspective. You know, are you half full, half empty? Are you a Colts fan, not a Colts fan? And I will say this, uh, I think they're a well-built team. They, they're really good in the trenches on both sides of the ball. A little, probably a little bit, um, a little bit of a step back on defense this year up mm -hmm. front, but, but still good enough against the run. And so they have that. They have, you know, decent quarterback play. Carson Wentz has been efficient. We've got to give them that. And, and they can run the hell out of the football, and, and they have a playmaker um, that can play with anybody in Jonathan Taylor. So, I mean, they have – they could use more weapons. They could use more depth in the secondary, right? They're not a perfect team, but who the heck is right now, right? It's not so, AFC. That's exactly yeah. right. Philly, take it away. This is a good team. I mean, the last eight weeks, the only two games they've lost – is overtime to Tennessee, another good team, and the one possession game they lost to the Bucs, as Stephen already mentioned. I mean, they blew out the Bills, who I still think are a pretty good team, and I think they showed that to a certain extent against Tampa Bay this past weekend. So I, I like the way they're built. I give a lot of credit to Frank Reich and everything that he's done with this offense and with Carson Wentz in particular, but I think this team, like the Patriots, and we talked about this different times during the year, whether it's um, the Browns, for instance, or you know, Baltimore is always in the conversation. This year, it feels like the league is shifting and it's helping the way defenses are playing is helping these teams that are built around their run game. The Colts are certainly one of those. And I would say the last two months have proven that. Steven, when we look at the Colts, <laughs> they are adopting the same stance that I think a lot of teams are going to until proven otherwise. And it was articulated by linebacker Bobby Okariki. And you tweeted it yesterday. It was great. No secret on the Colts game plan defensively for the Patriots Saturday night. Okariki said, we're going to try to make the game one dimensional and see what Mac Jones can do. First of all, helpful on his part. <laughs> yeah, I thought so too. <laughs> Second of all, is there a suspicion that he may not be up to that challenge, which that suspicion, I think, was suspicion, or at least, I don't know. He, until he does it, he hasn't done it. So right. take it away. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's logical, right? It makes sense. I mean, if, if you and I were coming up with a game plan, it's probably what we would do right now. We might be proven wrong. <laughs> and so that's the, the role of the dice. I mean, you, you're going to give yourself, you're trying at least to give yourself the best chance to win. They think presumably that's their best chance to win. Uh, now, what that will require is them to to make some plays in the secondary. Now, mm -hmm. one of the things that the Colts do is they do, they have done generally historically with this scheme that they play on defense. They've done a good job of keeping everything in front of them. It's it's not the Tony Dungy Tampa two, but it has elements of that, right? And so they they're going to do a good job of of making you have to go the hard way. Now, Mac Jones is patient enough that he might be able to do that. Um, he, he doesn't get greedy. He doesn't make terrible decisions, at least not, not often. Uh, so the question is, there's two questions, you know, can he, can he be patient enough to do that and, and matriculate down the field slowly and, and dink and dunk. And then the other question, I guess, depending on how you want to play is, can he make the big play and, and beat you that way? Because that's what teams are trying to do for the most part. They don't want to go 12, 13 plays because too many bad things can happen. So, and the other factor here that I think is related, the reason the Colts want you to have to go the hard way is they take the ball away. So if you have to go 12, 13, 14 plays, you're giving them opportunities. They're number one in the league in turnovers. I know the Colts, or excuse me, the, the Patriots are right behind them. So I think that's a big factor in this game as well. Steven, I, I, you know, we just mentioned some of the teams they've played. They have played Baltimore, the Colts have. They've played Tennessee. You know, those are run heavy teams too were they able to just sell out against the run and, and be effective? Because those are, you know, those are two losses on their schedule. They're close games, both of them, but they, they have lost both. So are they capable of doing what Bobby Okariki is, is saying they're going to do? Yeah. So against Baltimore, it's interesting. Baltimore really didn't have a big day running the football and they did a good job there. Now 
you're dealing with Lamar Jackson, right? And a little and different kind of run yeah, game. Yeah. And, and so the the problem with, with the I guess the difference, not the problem, the difference with Lamar Jackson is the stress that he puts on you when he does drop back. You know the things that he can do. Obviously, they're not dealing with that here with Mac Jones. Doesn't mean mm-hmm. Mac Jones can't beat him, but it's a different challenge. So uh, they lost containment with Lamar Jackson a few too many times, and you know what he does? He's looking for his tight end, and he did that repeatedly. The Colts, I think their weakness is in the middle of the field. I don't. This is not a. This is also not a secret. Bill Belichick can watch the film himself, and he will, and he'll see it. Uh, they have had a soft spot in the middle of the field. Their safeties have been hurt most of this year. They've got one back now, Kari Willis. That helps. Uh, Darius Leonard doesn't have the same range because he's had an ankle injury all season long. So I I think that has been where teams have attacked them. Uh, With the Tennessee game you mentioned, I I do think with Tennessee, it was a little harder to sell out because you do have some really premier weapons on that team. And and that makes that task a little tougher. Uh, They've given up some yardage to Derrick Henry over the years. But they've also done a pretty decent job of making him have to earn it the hard way, you know, three, four, five yards at a time. What you're trying to do is avoid that big run. And, and that is something they've generally avoided uh, with Derrick Henry. So uh, we'll see. I, I think they're up for the, for the challenge. And it's just going to be a matter of coming down to a few plays, I think. If we're talking about an idiot's guide to how the Patriots will attack them, it's just going to be run downhill. Everything between the guards, run it right at Darius Leonard, test him and then get that safety position to suck up and try and hit guys in the, in the, in the seam. And it's not going to be complicated, Phil. I mean, we've seen it innumerable times with this team. They are, (laughs) they are a game plan team, but when they say this is how we are and this is what we're going to do offensively. I mean, you saw it last week, we're coming to run the football at you. Do you see Phil? Do you think that they're going to be, I mean, they're not going to sex it up. Do you think? Well, I think it is just a question to, you know, to a certain extent, really any team, if they really decide to focus on it, can can slow the run game down enough just by devoting numbers right mm-hmm. into the box. So if, if they just keep sending bodies at that thing, uh, although the Bills didn't always have success against that uh, on Monday night doing the same thing, they had 10 guys in the box at times. But generally speaking, if you do that, teams will get away from the run. And if you do that, can they – make you pay on the outside. And that I, I still think is, is somewhat of a question for the Patriots. Like can Nelson Aguilar do enough in a one-on-one situation to really help you string together these kinds of drives we're talking about where the Patriots, they've been doing this all year, but they need those 12, 13, 14 play drives all the way down the field. They're going to, they're going to try to live in the field for, you know, in the middle of the field for the most part, whether it's run or pass. But if the Colts just try to muddy that area with bodies, whether or not they're actually, all that talented in the middle, just muddy it with bodies and force Kendrick Bourne, Nelson Aguilar to win on the outside. That, that wouldn't be a bad way to play it. If I was Indianapolis. Steven, is Carson Wentz a leading candidate in your estimation for comeback player of the year? I would say he, he should be a candidate for sure. I, I mean, we're talking about a guy who what last year had, I forget the number of interceptions, but a lot. And a lot. <laughs> who's counting right it was big he it was, was upside down put it that way <laughs> exactly and to see how efficiently he's played this year look I, I know there's a couple of of comical highlights or they're not highlights they're lowlights um you know the left-handed interception look I don't know if you can ever top that that's Mark Sanchez level stuff right but <laughs> <laughs> but uh to in his defense, and, and I know people in Philly just don't want to hear this, but it's the truth. I mean, Frank Reich has done an incredible job. He has put this guy back together. He is a competent quarterback. I'm not saying the best quarterback, but he's a competent quarterback. We're seeing the playmaking again. We're seeing him with throwing with accuracy much more often than he was last year. He's playing in rhythm. And, and I think it took him some time, though. You know, he was out all preseason. Uh, he he had that that foot injury, foot surgery. So, you know, there was a lot of they didn't have that time on task together with mm-hmm. his receivers. T.Y. Hilton was out and still is trying to get back into the fold. But my, my point is uh, he's overcome a lot this year. And I think now that he's settled in, we're seeing the real Carson Wentz. And you see shades of that guy you saw in 2017. I, I don't know if he'll ever be that guy again, but I have seen that guy at times. And honestly, I, I think if they got him 
some better weapons. And I think this is a long-term issue for the Colts, but if they get him some better weapons on the outside, which I think needs to be a priority, I think you're going to see an even bigger jump from Carson Wentz perhaps next year. Uh, And I just want to add one thing real quick. You guys, uh, Phil, you were talking about, you know, the way teams will attack the Patriots. I I think there's very much a similar blueprint here because although I think Carson Wentz, obviously big play, big arm quarterback. And so you have to be careful, you know, when you say making them one dimensional, the one thing the Colts don't have is they don't have the big time weapons outside. Michael Pittman's having a great year. I love Michael Pittman, uh, but their, their tight ends have kind of been underwhelming this year, which is unusual for the Colts. Uh, their, you know, their, their other receivers really have just kind of been by committee. Uh, so I, I think that's really, that's the approach the Bucks took. They said, look, you know what? Um, Jonathan Taylor will not beat us. And we're going to trust that, you know, your, your sort of uh, half ass receivers can't beat <laughs> our terrible secondary. <laughs> and You know what? They won the game. So I give them credit. Yeah, that would, that's really interesting that you bring that, that group up, Th- those Colts receivers, you know, they're big, right? Outside of T Y Hilton. And, and I just wonder how that plays, you know, can they just stick JC Jackson on somebody like Michael Pittman, who's going to be given, you know, JC Jackson giving up a lot of size in that matchup. And I think depending on how the game is called and Tom, I know you've already commented on, on uh, the officiating crew that's going to be working this game, but depending on how the game's being called, if it's one of those where they let these guys play, I could see that really benefiting these Colts receivers because they're so physical, especially at the tops of their routes and just creating separation that way. But if it's a little, if it's touchy feely, Tom, that could really work against Indy and make it hard for them to create some explosive plays, whether it's with penalties or just by winning at the tops of those routes by being as physical as they are. Yeah. It's Carl Sheffer's crew. They had the uh, Monday night game with a couple of late flags that were interesting. And they also are leading the league in flags thrown this year. So strap in for a long night, Saturday night in the end is this as close to mirror imagey as they could get Phil and Steven in terms of these two teams. There's a lot of similarities on their arcs, even though you know, the Colts had a much more profound rebuild to go through post Andrew Luck, um, you know, soup to nuts. The Patriots didn't go through the same thing, but the way they're constructed, um, I just, these are two really similar teams in the AFC going on the field, guys. They are, yeah. And, and Stephen, mm-hmm. one of the things that's interesting is, you know, we know they both like to run the ball on the other side. They both are pretty zone heavy defenses is my understanding Josh McDaniels talked about that a bunch yesterday about one of the reasons they're so good the Colts are at creating turnovers is because everybody's watching the ball because everybody is focused on the backfield on the quarterback if there's a tip or a deflection everybody's converging on that thing at the same time and the Patriots though they have been for years a heavy man-to-man defense have over the course of the last couple months really shifted hard and leaned into more zone coverages and I think that's helped them in terms of their turnover production. Now they're right there with the Colts near the top of the league in terms of that category. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think, you, you, Tom, you mentioned the, the arcs of this, these two teams. It, there's definitely a lot of truth to that. I think they're, they're very different teams, both of them. They're very different teams than they were just a few years ago. And they've had changes at the most important position in sports. We don't have to you know, go over that history, obviously. But I, I think there have... They have also, in both cases, I think, had a quick transition, which is good. Mm-hmm. You know, the the Colts, they had the one down season uh, when Andrew Luck retired. They went seven and nine. They bounced right back to 11 and five at Phillip Rivers. They're on their way potentially to the playoffs this year. So there are two teams that I think in the long term can be very relevant in the AFC going forward. And I, look, the rivalry's back on. I guess this whole thing came Maybe full circle. Maybe he's right. <laughs> Maybe, Maybe he's, he's right. Maybe he's exactly right. <laughs> All right, Stephen. I'm here for it, by the way. I am here for it. We need him. We need him. I mean, it's better. Like maybe there's the vacuum and there's not a Brady and and Manning at the top of the conference who are smashing heads and the Ben Roethlisbergers are getting flushed out and the Lamar Jacksons and Patrick Mahomes might not be exactly what we thought they were. But it's good if it's a steel cage match instead of just two Godzillas banging into each other. So, Stephen Holder, we appreciate it very much. Coming up next, we have Kyle Van Dorn. Kyle, this is my guy. Were you scoreboard yeah. watching it all on Sunday, watching the games as a fan or as a – yeah, I know. I know. And Just a little bit. No, it, it's always good to see friends play around the league. Uh, when I'm not play, I usually 
I uh, have it on as background chasing little man around, but it's, it was awesome to see Tom and Gronk play good as well as the rest of my friends, Fred Warner for the uh, Niners playing well, they got a big win in Cincy. So it's fun to see everybody play that I'm close with in the league. When you look at what the Bills have done, have you gotten into scoreboard watching around the league? I started off the show talking about how wide open the AFC is. And while you might have gotten a little separation, but go ahead. I can see you got them. You got to load it up. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's not. You watch, you watch as a fan, and obviously you watch a little bit just because it impacts your job um, per se. Uh, but really, it's more about just controlling what we're able to do. Uh, and, you know, we have a target on our back now, uh, even after our struggles in the beginning of the season, uh, going through those growing pains and finally catching stride and winning some games. We're just trying to continue to uh, strive for greatness keep going, building on yep. what we had. We got a tough opponent, the Colts, and we just got to go in a hostile environment and get another dub. Hey, they're a team that started out 0-3, just like you guys started out 2-4. and And it was interesting to hear Christian Barmore latch on to the 2-4 and mentality. He was talking about that today, which is something you've been talking about since 3-4, and to maintain that element of, look, we haven't done anything yet. Are the Colts playing in a similar fashion? They started 0-3. They've won five of their last seven. Yeah, they've had a playoff mindset every game. I think in even the last two, even the two games they did lose, they were winning in those games against the Titans and Tampa Bay. So, you know, they're a very tough opponent. Um, they've had some things not go their way and have some things go their way. But they have a great O-line, a great uh, offensive running back mm -hmm. in Jay Taylor. He's playing unbelievable. Uh, Wentz is playing good ball. And you can't sleep on their skill, guys. They, they can do it all. Uh, you got Pittman. You got Doyle. Uh, Pascal, Pascal he get, he's good. T.Y., he still got mm -hmm. it. So really, really good on offense. And then their defense uh, with Buckner up front. Oh, my goodness. He's that a beast. Good. He is. <laughs> and and Darius Leonard. Yeah, they're, they're just a really good team, top to bottom. Got a lot of pieces. With Michael Pittman, I mean, this is a guy who many people might not be up on right now because it's his second year in the league, a 40-catch guy last year. But he is at 6'4", 225, 230. He's a different kind of receiver. He's a lot to deal with. And he's got 67 catches, which is more than twice what any other wide receiver has on their team. Really a centerpiece for Wentz right now, huh? Yeah, the really good pickup by their front office. He's a really good player out of USC. Uh, he can do it all, too. Like, let's not sleep on his ability to take the roof off the top. He is fast for how big he is. Uh, but he does love contact. He is not afraid to initiate it. He's not afraid to go into the middle of the defense, into the teeth, and go up and get a ball. He's really, really good. Um, sky's the limit for the kid. We got to do our best to have all 11 guys pay attention to him and do our best. Uh, he's really good, and Wentz is finding him, mm -hmm. and they're doing their thing right now. They got good chemistry. Hey, with Taylor. Now, I, I'm lucky enough to have one of those end-of-the-season votes among the AP voters where MVP and all that stuff. Oh, you do? I do. Make sure you, you give me a vote. I do. <laughs> See, we can do. You've had a good year. You have had a good year. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. But with Jonathan Taylor, when we get to MVP, I just can't wrap my brain around ever giving an MVP to anybody who's not a quarterback. Because quarterbacks do so much every snap, 700 snaps a year. Even if you carry the ball 300 times, as Jonathan Taylor will probably do, you can never match the decision-making that has to happen at quarterback. So, two things. Jonathan Taylor, is he the best back you face this year? And two, am I a dink? I don't want to discredit any of the running backs we face, but he is very, very yeah. good. Um, I also think, too, you got to put Derrick Henry up there. No like he's, You're right. he's really good, and it's crazy that he slept on, even though he had 2,000 yards rushing last year. But JT, he's balling. He deserves his credit. His O-line's playing really well. 
Uh, JT is really, really fast. Yes. And that, that's what one thing I would say people underestimate him on is his speed. Obviously, he's big and can run you over, juke you, really good balance. But his speed is killer. He's really, really good in the open field. Hey, I wanted to ask you about um, the tragedy over the weekend with Demarius Thomas passing away. Um, he was here for a brief time. You only know him as I did as a, as a media member from afar with Denver. And then you get a chance to meet someone and you spend some time with them at their locker. And they're just not exactly what you thought. And I'm only seeing a tiny glimpse. What was he like as a teammate and, and just some of your thoughts on, you know, what a tragic loss that is? Yeah, that one hurt. Um, I got to shed my tears and, you know, he's an unbelievable person. Love him. He was like big bro to me instantly. Uh, spent some time in the offseason rehab when he did. So I got a chance to get close with him. He was rehabbing his Achilles coming off of that serious injury. And just talking to him as a person and as a human, he's always had a smile, always positive, always humble, always willing to teach. And I'll carry that with me all the time. I feel like I've taken that role on too, to always kind of be like DT in that regards of trying to bring somebody with you. And he was the ultimate team guy and just a good human. Um, he's going to be missed. I really miss him. I love DT forever and always. Uh, he was really big bro, really good guy. Hey, I appreciate you taking time to, to give people insight into to who he was and how he was, because he was only here for a minute, but he was a memorable yeah. guy. Good luck this weekend. Fly safe, play well. We'll see you next week. Let's go.